Welcome to another episode of In The Zone. I am your host, Chris Broussard. We got a tremendous show for you today. We interviewed David Fisdale, the former Memphis Grizzlies coach, who also was an assistant down in Miami. He shared some wonderful stories about coaching LeBron James and Dwayne Wade, particularly the moment, the practice, where Dwayne Wade said to LeBron, it's your show, man, it's your team, lead us to the promised land. Fisdale was there for that conversation. We also have my man, Jason McIntyre, in for another episode of Knockdown J. That's always fun. But first, we're going to start off, of course, with a top five list. And we are now at the first half mark of the season. We're midway through. So that got me to thinking, hmm, who are my top five MVP candidates? At number five, Giannis Antetokounmpo, the Greek freak. He has put Milwaukee basketball back on the map. 29 points, 10 rebounds, nearly five assists a game. The dude is virtually unstoppable. Still young, team isn't winning like an elite team, not a contender yet, but he is having a tremendous season. He must be rewarded and put on this list. At number four, Kyrie Irving. I get it. He's a point guard. He's only averaging five assists a game. That's second on his own team. That's 19th among point guards. That's 25th in the league overall. But stats do not tell the whole story. Kyrie Irving's leadership, his aura, his confidence in leaving LeBron James has really bolstered this squad. They're young. Their second leading scorer is 21 years old. Their third leading scorer is 19 years old, and he's got them at the top seed in the Eastern Conference. Like last year with Isaiah Thomas, Kyrie's not going to be the MVP, but he might finish in the top five for the first time in his career. At number three, <laughs> Kevin Durant. Led the Warriors to a 9-2 record without Steph Curry. Obviously, he scored the basketball. Obviously, he hit the glass. But he also flexed some point guard muscle, some playmaking muscle, and ran the squad pretty well. Gave him about five assists a game. But more importantly, and more astoundingly to everybody around the league, he's leading the NBA in block shots. You got to reward Kevin Durant when he is doing that type of thing. He might even be higher if he hadn't been injured. At number two, James Harden. Might be higher. You know what? Would be higher if he were healthy. He is out with a hamstring and they're saying it could be up to six weeks. I'm sorry. If you miss four to six weeks, you're probably not going to win the MVP award. Only one player since the ABA NBA merger in 1976 has won the MVP award with more than 11 games missed. That was Bill Walton way back in 1977. But that said, Harden was tremendous in the first half of the season, leading the league in scoring 32 points. Lead, second in assists, nine per game. First in PER, Harden been the bridesmaid in the MVP voting the last two years. It might happen again. Hopefully, though, he gets back sooner rather than later and can stay in the MVP race. And number one MVP over the first half of the season, LeBron James. Yes, this could be the year that LeBron matches Michael Jordan and wins his fifth MVP award. His offensive numbers are off the charts. Some people think they're the best offensive numbers he's ever put in his, up in his career. He's having a career high nine assists. He's at scoring more points than he has since 2010, his last year in Cleveland before he left to go to Miami. He is having a tremendous season also in terms of leadership, guiding him through Kyrie Irving's departure and tons of injuries, Derrick Rose, and of course, Isaiah Thomas. LeBron James, the MVP of the first half, also because you get some points for being there. LeBron is weighed in every game. Durant has it. Steph has it. You know, uh, Kyrie has it. You know, uh, who, nobody has. Ka Kawhi Leonard's hurt. I mean, everybody is going down, and this guy in his 15th season, you talk about an Iron Man. You got to give him some love. You got to give him some points for that. 
So LeBron James, the in the zone MVP for the first half of the season. All right, as always, it's time for Knockdown J with my man, Jason McIntyre. I'm surprised I'm you're going back, back, after, back after those win. beat downs over the previous weeks. But look, we're going to throw in a new wrinkle. Since Ooh. you like to keep score, I'm just it. having a good discussion. Life is but, a scoreboard. All right. That, that's, that's fair enough. So since life is a scoreboard, since Knockdown J is a scoreboard, we are bringing in my man, Josh Goldman. We call him Goldie here at Fox Sports. Nice little ball player, too. Yeah, doesn't doesn't look jumper. like he's it. Got a decent jumper. Got a, yeah, more than decent. He's a nice little, got a nice shot. I fed him Who with wins plenty of assists. Who one out of you two? Yeah. I'm the judge. I'm, I'm judging you. I'm, I'm surprised he is a question, but I'll leave it at that since he is the judge. Yes, he but, is. but uh So we're going to throw that wrinkle in. So let's get it started, let's get, man. What let's you get got it popping, Chris. So big week in the NBA. Once again, the Lakers are the biggest story in the league. They, they've overtaken everybody. Cavs struggling, but it's the Lakers. And Chris, I cannot help but get sick to my stomach watching this LeVar Ball garbage. Okay, this is tearing the Lakers apart. Okay, and Magic Johnson is the one to blame for this LeVar Ball drama. He got the Lakers in this mess, and I understand. I would have drafted Lonzo as well. So, but hold on, let me finish. He has to set perimeters. I know he tried that initially, and LeVar ended up lying to him. Okay, and then they had another meeting in November. Lon, uh, LeVar said, I'm going to cool out later, a week says. later, and now he's popping off again. Listen, Magic Johnson cannot let. Two rookies take all the questions from the media while Luke Walton is backed into a corner and, and just flailing there, twisting in the wind. Magic has to step up and do something with LeVar Ball. I don't know what that something is, but Magic Johnson, longtime player with the Lakers. He's now in the front office, the most recognizable man in the building. Somebody has to step up to LeVar. It's got to be Magic. So you said the, one of the first points you made was that Magic got them into this mess. Yes. Okay, so... Are you saying he should not have drafted no, Lonzo? He, he knew what he was getting into, and he did so not. So what? Set it but up what should have been done at that point? I mean, because that's 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 uh, critical to your argument. Yes. So Magic drafted him. Yes. You're saying he should have drafted him. So Magic you don't blame him for that. Him, but what should he have said to well, Lavar? He had at seen Lavar's recent history. Oh, my All son's better than Steph Curry. Yeah. And Magic Johnson had to say, LeVar, we're not going to put up with this. I'm drawing a firm line. We can't have this. Or we're going to do X, Y, Z. Or blah, blah, maybe we won't draft your kid. I don't want a problem tearing apart what is one of the best franchises in the history of the league. Okay. And, and okay. the Lakers cannot have This enough. is embarrassing. Enough, 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 enough. Okay. You don't have an answer. Okay. <laughs> I just gave you. You don't have an answer. If you can't say what Magic Johnson should do, then you can't jump on it. You have, to have, you have to have a definitive plan. This is what Magic Johnson should do or should have done. First of all, he did meet with Lonzo. He went to Chino Hills, Lonzo or LeVar. LeVar cooked him pancakes and said. And lied to and him. And lied to him. But if you're Magic at that point, that's all you can take. You, you go there, you tell him, look, Mike. we're concerned about, you know, you popping off. He tells you, I'm not going to do it. I just want to let you this? know where I stand. I'm a Magic Johnson all fan. Right, all he right. is my favorite player in NBA history. Okay. Okay. So I came repping Magic here. Look Continue. You trying to show off Continue. Guns. That Continue. will get you Continue. nowhere. Continue. That you. All right. Go here, ahead. Here's what I got to say. Magic is not mainly to blame. He does bear some blame, as they all do. LeVar Ball is mainly to blame. We know that. Blame. We know but that. He's the one that's mainly to blame because he should have enough sense, especially as a parent, to let it go. But he's selling shoes. So he, he needs to stay in the news. The only he's thing that's going to help him sell shoes is if Lonzo is a successful player. If Lonzo's a star, that's the only thing. And he is chipping away at Lonzo's chances of becoming a star. So here is how I think the Lakers should handle it. So LeVar is number one to blame. Secondly, Lonzo needs to sit down with his father. A 20-year-old. Yes, a 20-year-old. I was a 20-year-old once. Yeah, I grew you up, stepped to your dad, I, yeah, I'm sure. I, yeah, I'm 20 years. I grew up with an authoritative dad. As did Not I. like LeVar, but when I got to college, I became my own man and... I didn't, you don't step to him like you're going to fight. You don't step to him like you're demanding him or ordering him what to do. But you can step to him in love and say, Dad, 
just tone it down. You got to quit going at the coach. It's, it's causing you problems for me in the You don't think he's tried to do that? No, I don't. Oh, my gosh. I don't. Of course, at, at the you, minimum. You, you don't know that he's tried to do that. Well, I mean, the, I don't guess, know that he's the, guess, the logical guess is Lonzo said, Dad, Dad, can we chill out with the comments? Like, Not when I see. I, we don't no, need, this I, isn't I, helping me I in the locker That's room. not the logical guess. The logical guess is that. From every statement that Lonzo has made, his body language, when when they ask him about Luke Walton, he says, I'll play for anybody. Everything he's done and said leads me to think he hasn't said anything I, to his I dad. I can't believe you're blaming That's him. his opinion. So, no, I'm saying he has uh, – LeVar is to blame. I'm saying Lonzo, though, needs to talk to his dad about, like, quit with the outland. Please, dad, just cool out with the outlandish statements. Right. Then Magic, I think the first step for Magic would be go to Lonzo and say, because Lonzo might be the only one that can stop LeVar from saying no this stuff. No way is LeVar going to stop because of what his kid says. Really? No, no shot. It's, I'm, again, I'm not telling Lonzo to go up there and get in his chest and be like, look, man, you need to cool out. I'm saying go to him like, Dad. This is killing me in the locker room. This is killing, like, I like Luke. You know, let's just let it go. Like, if, if your son comes to you like that, what dad would not take heed well, to that? You're talking about normal human beings who I, understand okay. logic. If that doesn't work, so I'm saying Magic needs to go to Lonzo, talk to Lonzo about going to his dad. If that doesn't work, then Magic needs to, if he, this is out of control because be, uh, something we haven't got to, I'll save that for later. But, <laughs> Magic needs to go to LeVar. If if Lonzo talking to him doesn't work, then Magic needs to go to LeVar and say, look, we're going to trade Lonzo if you don't cool out. We'll ship him to Sacramento. Listen, we'll ship him wherever, and but that's, he that's wants to be a play. Laker, so we, we will trade him. Who is the did. only adult in that conversation? It ain't LeVar Ball, who just yanked his kid out of high school to go play in Lithuania. It ain't Lonzo, who's 20. Magic That's Johnson. A, they're all Magic adults. Johnson is the only adult of those three. Leaders are supposed to be honest with themselves. Look around. Magic walks into the facility. Everybody's looking at Magic. What, what do we do about LeVar? Magic, we're, uh, you're the where, guy. Where I agree with you is that Magic should give a vote of confidence to Luke Walton. He definitely should. He, he needs should to do that. Come but out. a lot of times people take votes exactly. of confidence negatively. They think, oh, there's the dreaded vote of confidence. Now he's about to get fired. So, Well, nothing, t- saying nothing also is negative, right? I mean, just letting the guy twist in the wind. Yeah. It's no, ugly. It's I, ugly. I spoke to one of the best GMs in the league yesterday. He told me the way to handle – now, I don't necessarily agree, but he said the way to handle LeVar Ball is to just ignore, don't even ignore right. a- Acknowledge it. Just totally ignore it. I, I don't think that. that could work today. I don't think it's going to work today. Yeah, so I, would en- I would endorse that. Goldie. My main man, my backcourt mate, we won a championship together. I don't think you can say that with We did not with, win a championship. We, we over lost here. in the semifinals. It's true. We twice. did lose with J Mac. We did, right. yes. Magic is the president and face of that organization. He set up Lonzo on that draft day just as much as LeVar did, saying all the great things and don't take all of my records. Well, and you got to give points to the guy wearing the jersey. And plus, I'm a little afraid of those guns he's got over there. <laughs> it's a victory. one nothing McIntyre. All right. That's your first win oh, of the whole all right. show. Well, let's go two for two here. Get, all right. But it's not LeVar to blame, though. Come on. Just be a regular parent and chill. I agree. Yeah, he, nothing about him is regular. All right, Chris. On to your favorite player, your favorite city, your favorite franchise. The Cleveland Cavaliers. I, I'm looking at their struggles, Chris. <laughs> they can't stop a nosebleed right now. Okay. Lost five of their last seven. Gave up a buck 30, I think, to the Orlando Magic. Here we go, Chris. There is no reason for LeBron James to stay in Cleveland. I'm just going to let that go out there, and I'm not even going to defend it because you know you hear that. You're like, that's solid. He's right. <laughs> no, that's no. Not- the floor is yours, Chris. There, first of all, there are plenty of reasons. Number one, number one, no. you're from the area. You're from Northeast Ohio. You wanted to go home to win a ring. Got it. Mission accomplished. Well, you Next. wanted to go home. You know, so that's a reason right there. Secondly, there is something to be said for building. It can't always be laid out on a silver platter for you. You are the best player in the world. You are. I say the second best player of all time. Agreed. Some people argue a, a minority, but some people argue you're the best player ever. 
you you take up the challenge of leading this team back to a championship. Because here's the thing: how far away are they? I mean, they they're almost, far away. They almost it's, beat. They're gonna get to the finals as long as they it's almost. There. Who they almost beat? They almost beat Golden State in 2015 with Matthew Dellavedova. This Della is Vadova. not even close to the same. Stop it! I gotta stop with you there. With Matthew Dellavedova as his second guy. All right, so all I'm saying, look, here's what I'm saying. <laughs> all championships, like, to go to a stacked team, if you're LeBron James, no, no, and just no, become he... a mercenary and just keep trying to win championships, I'm not saying it's the worst thing in the world, but I'm saying there is also something to be said for building, building something. a team. Time out. And they already, already have a you pretty know good all-star in Kevin Love. Let's see what Isaiah Thomas is, you know, as he gets back into shape. And build it. Now, I, I get it. You don't want to keep going to the finals and losing. What? But okay. would you rather go to the West? Can we get a 20-second timeout here right here? Okay. Building something. The first time he was in Cleveland, he let the GMs build it. They did a terrible job. He saw the Boston Celtics build a big three. He went to Miami. LeBron built a big three in Miami. They won. LeBron goes back to Cleveland. Builds a team, right? He gets J.R. Smith, Mozgov. He builds it. He got the ring. It's time to build something somewhere else, Where? like he's, in he's Los in his Angeles. Fifteenth year. Los How much time does and... he have to build? I'm saying, when I say build, I don't mean start from scratch. I mean you already have an all-star in Kevin Love. You got another all-star in Isaiah Thomas. You have some good role players. Make it work. Yeah. If you look, some good and, role and, players. And I'm not, you know look, they have one of the oldest I, rosters in the league. Yeah, I know. And they are they basically capped out. Jay Crowd is not a good role player. Serviceable. Iman Shumper is not a good role player. No, he's Tristan not. Tristan Thompson not a good No, role he was out-rebounded by oh, Curry in the finals. And you want him to go play with Lou Al Dang well, and Larry Nance No, no, Lou Al Dang doesn't play. Stop, 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 Look, stop. Here's this this is all, I, old... all I'm saying is this. To say there's no reason. I'm not saying there aren't things to look at elsewhere. But to say there's no reason to stay with, in Cleveland, there's plenty of reason. He wants to catch Michael Jordan. In a lot of people's eyes, you're not going to catch no, Michael Jordan not. by going somewhere not else. Happening and win it with a stacked team. You will catch, if you can turn Cleveland back into oh, a champion. He already did that two years once, ago. Michael That's jo all, that's look, enough. This, no, it's not. This should, not to pass Jordan. Oh, it's enough you go to, to be You go to the Lakers. Great. Okay, hold on. Look, we talk about this building stuff. Michael Jordan took a moribund franchise in the Bulls. Moribund? Made, made them a $10 one word. of the top franchises yeah. in the NBA. That's the, a lot of people will never give LeBron take him over Jordan until he did something like that and made it a dynasty. Yeah. So I'm th that's the challenge that's there in yeah. Cleveland, and a challenge is always a reason yeah. to stay. So that's all I'm saying. Okay. I'm not LeBron, saying he you said LeBron should, doesn't want to be a mercenary. No, I didn't say that. Yeah, Michael Jordan. I didn't say he doesn't want to. Michael be. Jordan left to go play baseball. Then he came back, won with the Bulls. I'm gonna come back That's with the a Wizards. No, I'm just saying he bounced around. Everybody bounces bounced around. around. He Kevin stayed Durant. With the Bulls throughout his prime. Kevin Durant just bounced from OKC. People are more upwardly mobile now. This is 2017. This isn't 1985, Chris. The it, the the economics are different. The free agency is different. People move around. That's the new NBA. Now I want to ask you this question, Chris. Who's set up for more success in the immediate future? The young, stacked Boston Celtics with picks galore, Gordon Hayward coming back. The young, really promising 76ers, Simmons, Embiid, your guy. Markel Fultz, we don't know what he is. These teams in the near future are going to pass Cleveland in the coming years. Cleveland's old, okay? They don't play a lick of defense, 29th in defensive efficiency. Celtics are one. The Lakers are top 10. I believe, Josh, you can double check that. I think they're still top 10. They're younger. They have more so, promise. So and LeBron can say, Paul George, come on over. Just like I built in Miami, just like I built in Cleveland. Give me LeBron, Paul George, Kuzma, Ingram, Lonzo. That is a long, defensive-minded, really impressive Starting five is that can beat, switch is it beating with any. State? Well, we'll see. They can we'll see. I'll no, tell you. I'll tell you right now. They they can defend Golden State much better than this Cleveland team can. That that may be true, but look, Boston, Philadelphia. Their their future is brighter the than Cleveland. Immediate future. Immediate future. The What's next that? three years. This year. The next, next three years. years. It's all based on how LeBron's got about three years left in his prime. At, I would think Which at is best. Crazy to say. At, probably at best. Maybe two. Maybe who, two. Who knows? That's the immediate future. They're still the best team in the East. 
as long as he's there. For the next year. What are they, third in the East right year, now, Josh? What were they last year? They were second. Yeah. Who was the best team well, in the Well, Kyrie East Irving's not here, so I, I, we got to stop this last year business. No Kyrie Irving. It's a different story, Chris. Unless you think Isaiah Thomas's karate chops are going to translate in the playoffs. Isaiah Thomas. Yeah? I got to take a shot at your guy, cl- IT4. He's had two very good games with them. One poor game. One poor game. Yeah. It's right. the three games in. I'm not He's, overreacting. You are overreacting. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Goldie. You a Laker fan. Goldie, so take off your, your shirt and reveal your uh, Tristan Thompson Unless you've got another Cavs jersey under there, there's no way you won this argument. <laughs> oh. CB definitely won. First off, it's 2018. It's not 2017 anymore. <laughs> and second off, LeBron's 36-5 and five versus the East the last three years. Why is he leaving the conference? Thank you. We gave you, you a round. Goldie. About time we give the guy a round on his own podcast. All right, final topic. Uh, you moved on quickly. Is, <laughs> <laughs> gotta keep it moving, Chris. Um, you love the OKC Thunder. Westbrook, I believe you got him on speed dial. He's in your contacts. You guys are tight. Um, I need you to send a message to them. There is no way OKC should be looking to trade Paul George. I can't believe that I'm even hearing this, reading about it. Paul George may not stay. Let's see what we can get for him. First of all, there's no market for Paul George. The Lakers, everybody knows he wants to play for the Lakers. So nobody's giving up anything of value to get Paul George at the trading deadline. Okay? Oh. Okay, so he's not getting a high pick. And listen, it's only been 40 games. Like, relax. Okay, so he's a top five defensive team in defensive efficiency. Offense has taken a little more time. But the other reason you don't trade him, things happen. James Harden is hurt. Kawhi Leonard is hurt again. Okay, Durant's gone down. Curry's gone down. The Timberwolves. Why, do, are young. why doesn't that logic apply to LeBron James and the Cavs? Because LeBron never gets hurt. But no, this is but a, but I'm talking about with Le, the Cavs getting to the finals, which we know they will. Maybe. What about all these guys in the West that might go down? What if LeBron gets to the finals and Durant gets hurt? Let's stay or on Curry track. Gets, yeah, yeah, let's all right. stay on track. Here. Just point that out, Goldie. But it's, Just it's point a that fair out. point. <laughs> but w- given what we've seen in the West, Chris, no way the Thunder should be looking to trade Paul George. Look. Right now, I don't believe they're thinking about trading him. Uh, I'm not saying they definitely should, but I'm leaning toward that way. As much as I like Paul George and that trio, here's the deal. I got to hear this. Even with best case scenario, let's, uh, you know, you you don't calculate injuries. So let's just say teams are relatively healthy and have their stars. Best case scenario, they get to the Western Conference Finals. Best case. They're not winning the West. I would agree. And they probably, at this rate, you know, if they're the fifth seed and they win that series, let's say it's Minnesota right now, they're sixth, I believe. I love me some Minnesota team. Let's say they beat Minnesota, which is, you know, they might not. Then they got Golden State in the second round. So they may even just get ousted in the second round. In a good case scenario, like the trio is clicking. Westbrook and George and Melo are coming together well. Best case scenario, you don't win a championship. And you, so you're willing to take that risk that when, when the risk is, the reward isn't that great because it's second round or conference finals. You're willing to risk this guy staying with you. You said everybody knows he wants to play for the Lakers. So I don't know that that's a smart risk to take. Okay, because then you could lose him for nothing. You're not, don't tell me, oh, cap space. Nobody's going to Oklahoma City as a free agent. So Wait, wait, nobody said, wants to play with your guy Westbrook? No, it's oh, not that's that. A shocker. No, nobody really wants to go to Oklahoma City. Oh, so I mean, that's Westbrook. what it is. Yeah. It's, it's more about just locale. It's like Utah. Those aren't destinations. you got to get Utah? They're not destination cities. I'm just it's saying. It's a lovely city. Yeah, all right. So <laughs> resort to jokes and trickery. Tricknology when you knowledge. <laughs> We're inventing words now. He's so desperate. The, the hip-hop hands will get that. <laughs> See, um, no. Here's the thing. You got me off track with your jokes. Um, there is a market for Paul George. The market is this: the Lakers, if they fear he could go elsewhere, let's get him now. Where? Th- that's the second okay. market. Any team that's a contender and feels like George can get them over the top. I mainly the Cleveland Cavaliers. And here's the situation. I've been I was told when there was talk about George going to Cleveland in the summer that Paul George was willing 
to stay in Cleveland, not just this year, but next year. Because remember, he well, doesn't, that have, does to, change. That he doesn't change have to be things. a player, a free agent. Right. He's got a player option. And I'm told he was willing to say, I'll stay in Cleveland not only this season, but I won't become a free agent. I'll give it two years. LeBron would, if LeBron would commit to stay, LeBron did not okay. commit. Let me stop you there so and ask. If George, so I think Cleveland, if you're Paul George, you go to Cleveland for, say, Tristan Thompson, the Cavs first Why round. Why on earth Hold on. the Thunder Let me finish. The Cavs first round pick wait, wait, and Cavs Iman Shumpert Nets or whoever. No, no way I'm giving up the Nets Well, pick. you're not kidding. But you're not, not, the Thunder are Sam Presti you rather lose him for nothing? Sam would, you Presti rather is, lose, would you rather lose him for nothing? I would not take on Tristan Thompson's bad contract when he ain't playing with Steven Adams on that team. Tristan Thompson is All not All right, then it could here. be somebody else. Channing Fry, he's a shooter. You need shooters with Westbrook. Who I'm just saying Cleveland can come up with a package. Uh, that would Cleveland be, would be interested. That would be an all-time Paul stunner. George. If you have inside information and you could get Paul George to the Cavs for Channing Fry and Iman Channing. Shumpert. Maybe, well, so a maybe I need to play I'm in just your saying, fairy throw, world, Chris. Throw in something. Throw in something, but Cleve, you if you're Oklahoma City, you need to be open okay. to exploring. Are you throwing in that Nets pick? No! Okay, well, then Sam Presti's hanging up. He's no, he's not hanging up because Sam Presti don't have any leverage. Sam Presti is about to lose a perennial all-star for nothing. So what? He's got Westbrook for five years and $200 million. You, you build it's around about build. You can build around Westbrook with the role players that you get. For I, Paul I, George, I maybe it's but even turn look. It, turn it over to Josh. No, no, I'm do not this. done because okay. you don't have anything to say. Right. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's even look. They love him in Cleveland, but maybe you got to throw in. You know who you throw in? I was gonna say Kyle Corver, but maybe it would be Jay Crowder, because Jay Crowder. Jay Crowder's not bad. Jay Crowder is a defender. He can defend like Robertson. And he can hit the three. Better than Robinson. So, better than, much, throws. much better than Robinson. Robinson. And make free. So now you don't have to have uh, there's something a fourth. There. And, and I don't need uh, Crowder as much if I'm Cleveland because I'm getting Paul George, right. who's a great defender and going to okay. take his minutes. So there's, there, there's a kernel there. I that's exactly more than a kernel. <laughs> you know that. And look, if you're Paul George, put yourself in Paul George's shoes. And you go to Cleveland. You Clearly, you're going to reach, you reach the NBA Finals. You lose to Golden State in a tough six or even seven it's games. Are you leaving who Cleveland else, I mean, who to go else to the is Lakers? On that, like you're you're losing Jay Crowder and who else? Okay, here's it's a little hyper. No, you're not losing anybody critical. You losing, losing Jay IT4? Crowder? Who? It four? No. Get real. You I'm not getting. Let me let me set nothing. Yes, you you can. They got him. They gave up Victor Oladipo, who wasn't valuable at that Bro, time. Bro, Victor Oladipo. Now he is. is I give you that. But he wasn't playing that way for the first five years of his career. Not just yeah, last like five year. different head coaches. Let's not whatever Victor the case, Oladipo. Nobody. Everybody killed that trade around the league. I everybody. Did. I killed the trade. Okay, so that's my point. You don't have to give up. You're not giving up equal but that value was it, to clear cap for Paul space. George. They wanted to clear cap space. My, you're not. They know you wouldn't get equal well, value. Luckily, for Paul Goldie's George. father is an uh, NBA is, GM. If Goldie I mean, goes against me on this, there's one. no way this fictitious trade is giving you a victory. But we'll see. I wish my father was a GM in the NBA, <laughs> but I gotta go with Chris on this one. How can you, if you're the Thunder? Your ceiling, you just admitted, was a conference championship. You're going to lose Paul George for nothing. You need to get something in return. They got Terrence Ferguson. I like Ferguson, by the way. He's okay. 0 for 2 last night. Exactly. Pieces. These are the pieces the Thunder need. I want this to be like the headline on YouTube. Broussard is saying Jay Crowder and who? No, no, no. Did you listen to me? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is Cleveland can put together a package that gives the Thunder something Role players to put around Westbrook. Okay. Guys that can shoot the three. Guys that can defend. Those are the types you build around with Russell Westbrook. And it's better than losing an asset, a great asset, for nothing. I will, I will, let me lastly add, I would be very upset if that happened. Because you Paul just George, like killing the thunder. Paul George and LeBron joined forces. That would be bad news for the Warriors. For the Lakers, who oh. would never get LeBron So then, okay, what if Paul, so George, if Paul George goes to Cleveland, what do they do? Like, for, and well, you're they're not getting, legitimately I'm good. I would be IT, scared I'm of them. keeping my Brooklyn pick. Look, I all just that. don't think that's reasonable. But it is reasonable because that's how the league works. Okay. You're not getting equal uh, that, value. That would be great news for the NBA because all of a sudden the Warriors have a challenge 
And then the Lakers don't get LeBron, the Lakers don't get Paul George, because they're going to stay together, right, and give so it a shot. So you just completely agree with me. Well, yeah, but I just think there's no chance that trade happens. <laughs> there's none. <laughs> okay. This was an episode, an ugly, one-sided oh, route oh of a knockdown, Jay. Thank you, Goldie. The great Goldie, Josh Goldman. I got 20 Goldman. bucks here for you, buddy. Come on. Nah, good, you, you, look, good job. Hey, Fizz. What's up, brother? Hey, man. How you doing? Doing great, man. Doing great. Good, Just good. Thank you. with my wife and dogs. <laughs> now, are you in Memphis or are you out in L.A.? I'm in Memphis right now. Okay, so you still living there. Yeah, we still gonna have our house here, uh, and you know, if somebody comes along, that we are gonna put it on a little pocket listing and keep it here, so we can keep getting our our uh, residency here. You know, oh, no okay. Tax. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Hey, I, I ain't trying to part with that money to be <laughs> California. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that, man. I hear that. Yeah. That makes sense. So, yeah, we'll be bouncing back and forth, you know, and uh, I'm gonna hit Miami a ton too. So okay. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going there next week to see those guys. So. Do you guys have kids yet? No. You okay. know, I got an older son before her, but yeah, we I knew that. Yeah. all together. So okay, okay. We can maneuver a little easier, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So we, we let's go ahead and get started. Uh, cool. Yeah. First off, how, um, how have you been spending your time since uh, you were let go in Memphis? Probably uh, more leisurely than anything else. Just really spending a ton of time with my wife. You know, I got to spend a lot of time with my family back in L.A. over the holidays, which I never get to do. Uh, you know, to spend that kind of quality time with them was great. And my mom's birthday falls around the same time. So I got to do a lot of stuff, you know, that I wouldn't normally get to do as a family member. So yep. that's really been kind of my deal right now. And then, you know, some... I've had some cool little uh, breakfast meetings or lunches or whatever you might say with some different people that I've wanted to learn from, um, you know, but I'm really about to get into that kind of stuff and start diving into my my visits and start getting my education going. Yeah, so you'll go to, like, teams' practices and – how how much do you do you sit in on you know do you get to sit in on coaches meetings or is it more just attending practice and talking with guys or what? I gotta be honest with you, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know what my I don't know what my access is gonna be in this thing, man. I'm just kind of going with the flow and whatever teams let me see and let me yeah. uh, be a part of. Then I'll you know I'll take it as it comes. You know um, I'm just more. I like to, uh, you know, I just like to learn. And I just think that uh, I got so much respect for so many different coaches in this league and what they're doing. You know, I just think it's cool to see how other people do their thing. Yeah, I've always wondered, because, you know, like you said, I mean, when coaches aren't working, they that's what they do. Right. I wonder how it works. Like, do coaches, will a coach share everything he knows or his offense or, you know, because this is a guy right. you're going to be competing against. You know, right. maybe could compete against for a job at some point. You know, like right. I wonder how much they share. You know, it's uh, it's interesting too um, because I think it's when you when you go visit teams, it's usually going to be somebody that you're very close to, mm -hmm. or it's a team that's like elite. And I think when you become elite, you really don't give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. like. Can you execute this better than me? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, so you don't mind sharing, uh, you know, to that extent. And then the other guys are just people that you're so close to, you probably know their stuff like they do. You yeah. know, like when I go back to Miami, although I'm sure they've evolved a ton and I'm going to learn a ton when I get back there, you know, there's just a comfort level with, between us that, you know, we can share like that. Yeah, and yeah. we're always pushing each other to learn and, trying to help each other get better anyway. So, you know, those are the situations, um, you know, and, and you don't even want to go bother those teams that's like in the mix <laughs> of like trying to make the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, coach is coaching for his life. Yeah. You know, that ain't, I'm not going to bother no team, you know, under those circumstances, man. They got enough on their plate and I totally get it. Not that any of those other teams don't, but it's just a different circumstance. You know? Yeah. No, nah, I, I feel you. I feel you. And you mentioned great players. Obviously, LeBron, um, Wade, Bosh, you had you had at least you know three of them. 
uh, in their Allen. prime. Yeah, I was gonna say that's why I said in their prime because Ray. Yeah, in the prime. Yeah. The prime. I mean that yeah. shot. In fact, you okay? You, since you brought up Ray, I mean, I I think it's certainly uh, arguable that that shot he hit in Game Six in 2013 is the biggest shot in NBA history. What were what were you guys thinking before that? I mean, did you? Everybody else thought it was over. I mean, I don't know yeah. if you can let yourself think that way as a coach, but you know, what were your you guys thinking before that play? Uh, we all had that moment of great doubt. You know, obviously, I, I talk about we looked around each, at each other in the huddle, and you could just see it was like, oh crap! Like we this this is really happening. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and and Spo was like I always said, Spo was just that. I'll never forget the huddle. You know, he looked up, he said, "One play." He just kept hitting the board. One play, stay in the moment. One play, and he ran a play that we had been running all year in practice, but never ran. Um, you know, and a lot of teams run it as pistol hammer, just yep. a little action to get Brown the ball back. He missed the first three. We ended up tipping it back out, and he hit the second one. And they just our guys just kind of stayed with it. We fouled, they met one or two, and we ran the same play again. And good Lord, thank God for Ray Allen. <laughs> Chris Bosch and Ray Allen. That's and all right. those guys had a part in, you know, real basketball history, man. Oh, and man. I just, it was just unbelievable. Ray's reaction to it all was. <laughs> What did, how did he react? Because, I, I mean, was he just cool about it out no, in the huddle or what? No. Oh, and once he got back to the huddle, no, and none of that, no parts of it. <laughs> you know, when we were in the huddle doing the play call, the drawing up of the plays, everybody settled in. But when he made the shot, I can't say it, you know, without, I'm not going to curse on him, but he <laughs> he was telling them, get them effing ropes out of Yeah, there. that's right. You're right. <laughs> I mean, it was like, it was pandemonium, yeah. you know, and yeah. so – and then, you know, that series wasn't over then. We played another game right to the end. Yeah. you were, did, I know Tim, Tim Duncan is still probably haunted by the shot that he missed. He yep. missed a bunny over Shane Battier, and all of our hearts was in our, you know, down. <laughs> yeah. Where we was just like, oh, my God. And that's just the kind of series it was, man. It was, I think it was one of – to me, it was one of the best series. It was, it was To me, it reminded me of the, the Golden State – Cleveland series when Cleveland beat them. Mm. Just how it came down to that that last, last play. play. Yeah. You know, just basically two. And that's when you know you got the two best teams. Yep. Yep. You played a seven-game series down to the last play. You got two damn good teams. Yeah, yeah. When when you when you guys were in Miami with LeBron, was obviously you knew he was great. I mean, when, when he said he was going there. <sighs> but was there any incident, any moment in practice or anything where – you guys as coaches or even maybe players just realize, man, oh, this dude's better than we even thought. Well, it was – it was. I can't really say today, but I do remember a practice early on um, that first year where it was like he just said, I'm going to show you guys today. <laughs> and – he was unstoppable. Like it was just, it was, and everybody got to go at him. Udonis got to guard him. Chris Bosch was trying to guard him. D Wade was trying to guard him. Shano. And it was just like, oh my God, like these guys are like, he's not going to miss a shot. And we can't, <laughs> they can't stop him from getting anywhere he wants. We can't get a double team on him. And it was like, okay, we're looking at this is what the top tier of, you know, the actual cream of the crop look like. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so and then after that, we just got to see it a lot. <laughs> yeah, I was lucky, man. Four years of it, I got to see some performances that how, were just wow. Yeah, <laughs> how, how did um? Because it, it, you know that it. This may be simplifying the narrative, but you know everybody feels like after you guys lost to Dallas, you know Dwayne kind of decided, look, for us to be able to win, LeBron's got to be in the driver's seat. Um, and that was kind of what happened. Did you? Did the coaching staff talk with him about it? Was that no. just his realization, or or that what? Was, that was. I mean, every it was the elephant in the room. Okay. For the most part, but nobody was was necessarily saying it had to happen. Where Dwayne just told him, and Dwayne, in his way, was like he he was trying to have it happen organically and just hey man, just take it. 
LeBron respected Dwayne so much that he was like, I'm not doing that. Like, he, mm-hmm. he, he wouldn't go just do it. And, I, you know, I, I said it before, we was just shooting free throws one day in that second year. And it was me, D-Wade, and Bron sitting at one end of the court. And D-Wade just looked at him and said, hey, man, this is your team now. Mm. Take it. And LeBron looked at him. He just gave him that, you know, you, you've been around LeBron enough times. LeBron kind of just gave him that nod and that look. And D-Wade was like, all right. He was like, all right. Wow. And from then on, <laughs> it was a different team. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> <job easy. laughs> that first yeah, you said making the job easy. Was it hard the first year because it was kind of that, like you said, the elephant in the room, nobody did. Was it, is there a situation or was there where you didn't know whose team it was or, yeah. you know? Well, it, well, and it wasn't like out of like them fighting for, it was actually them doing it the, the other way. They were all trying to get out of each other's way. Like D-Wade was trying to take a step back for LeBron. LeBron was taking a step back for him. Chris Bosh was taking a step back. So everybody was getting out of each other's way and they got paralyzed early on, especially mm-hmm. offensively. Who's going to take the last shot? You know what I mean? Yep. All of this stuff. Who's who's initiating this play? Who's doing this? Who, what's our spacing around you guys? Like, we we're still figuring all of that stuff out. And really, our defense carried us that first year. Yeah. You know, our defense was phenomenal that first year. That was best training camp I ever been a part of, especially from a defensive standpoint. Those guys got after it, and Spo did a heck of a job emphasizing it. So, you know, the offensive part came the next year. Once those guys started to figure out, okay, here's the pecking order. Okay. And then Chris Bosch, the ultimate sacrifice, yeah. he stepped out to three. And he gave up a lot of his touches on the post. And you're talking about a guy who in Toronto averaged 25 a game and yeah. a big chunk of his game was isolation. So, you know, he really was the guy that was – he was the key to unlock it all. Yeah. You know, that the conversation between Dwayne and LeBron was important. But Chris Bosh's evolution unlocked the whole thing. Was there a conversation with him where he just decided to do it and just like organically? Keith Askins, man, he grabbed him and said, Keith saw it before all of us. He said, for this thing to really work, you're going to have to be able to shoot that three. And let's start working on it. And you just see Chris Bosh because he's so diligent Mm -hmm. (laughs) every day, (laughs) not talking to nobody, just getting up his threes with K, <laughs> and, you know, sure enough, he gets hurt against Indiana. We find a way out of that series and get to Boston. We get Chris back for that series, and it turns out that his three threes against Boston was the thing that won our series for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, in that game seven, Chris Bosh in the corner, KG kept coming off the corner man on the drive, which is natural for fives. Yep. And Chris Bosh just lined him up, and it was huge. And from then on, Chris Bosh was the difference. Now, Pat Riley, he he refers – I don't know if he still does. He used to call LeBron the boat, best of all time. What's your take (laughs) on it? Is he he the boat, the goat, whatever you want to call it? (laughs) I think he's got – I think he he brings the most tools out of all of the people in the conversation. Okay. I think he does. He is the most versatile player in the history of the game. Um, there's no guy that could play all five positions, defend all five positions, and then you know, then yep. score, assist, yep. rebound, shoot from anywhere on the floor. You know, he has all of it. He he really does. He's. I don't think there was one player in the history of our game that has that many weapons uh, at that level of athleticism uh, that he has. Yeah. How do we measure best of all time and goats and boats? And I don't know. <laughs> I'm such a, you know, I just know what I've seen in my lifetime and what I enjoy. And I just see him as the most versatile. I just, it's never been a player like him. Uh, you know, you're starting to see these kids, the whole game has shifted to guys like him now. Yeah. That who can be six nine, handle the ball, post shoot, switch. <laughs> yeah. You know, because because everybody had to figure out how do we put enough of those kind of guys on the floor to guard LeBron. <laughs> and that's what Golden State does. Golden State gives, has a chance to be Cleveland um, when they play them because they could put a lot of six eight, six eight, six nine. You know. 
size guys out there. Yeah. You know, and so no matter who gets matched up on them, at least they got the size to try to battle. All right? Not that they always successful, but they give they give themselves a good chance that way. And that's what the game is turning into. Look at all the kids now, Ben Simmons and Ingrams and all of these guys. You know, they're all that 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 type of player. So <clears throat> he's really changed it all. And you know, I don't know if you you know. Ultimately, I know a lot of people going based on how many championships you've won. You know, all of that stuff. I know we've been lucky to watch a guy go through this whole process from his start till now, 15 years later, and still watching him do it at this level. It's, we're very lucky. (laughs) What do you, um, how you feel? You you feel like Cleveland's clearly the team to beat in the East? Like they're clearly the best team in the East? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think because he, it's him. It's him. Yeah. It's, it's, it's no no one has him. And those listen, those kids in Boston are tough. Mm-hmm. So, oh, do I like watching them play? And Brad puts them in such a great situation to, to shine and, and to really you know highlight what they do. But they're not him, <laughs> and they got they got a ways to go to get to that. And when the playoffs hit. He's beyond. He turns into the other him. It's a different. Yeah, and, he takes it to yeah, a different level. Yeah. So now you know. I don't see no no one in the East can deal with that. And so again, it's gonna. I just barring injury and things like that, and the fact they're gonna get Isaiah. Oh, come on, Isaiah's just coming back now. And you saw how that looked that first game. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because they. You know, look. I get why Boston did it because Kyrie is that younger super talent, and you're moving into the future. But they. Cleveland didn't get chopped liver back. No, I agree. I Good actually, God. I think, I mean, I think Kyrie's the best player in the deal, but I yeah. think Cleveland won it because they got Jay Crowder and, and they got Crowder the pick, you know, Brooklyn pick. Yeah, so. Yeah, how many of those six, six, seven, six, eight, six, nines can you put on the floor? That yeah. can guard everybody and shoot threes. Jay Crowder is one of those tough physical guys that way. He's that Richard Jefferson that they don't yeah. have, that they lost in Richard. So. Now you throw Isaiah Thomas, who, by the way, will put a dagger through your heart and <laughs> smile at you while you fall to your death. <laughs> He's scary good. Yeah. Like, think about that. They got three guys now that can close games because you know D Wade can still close. Yeah, D Wade is not afraid of, of hitting game winning shots and, and rising to the moment. And they got him right in, this, in a great situation, leading the bench. I just I don't see it in the East anybody that can take them out. Do you, you give know? them how much of a chance do you give them to beat Golden State? Assuming I assume that's who you pick in the West, Golden State. Yeah, I mean I give them a puncher's chance, but I just think Golden State is the team to beat. <clears throat> I really do. I think with with full health, Cleveland's really got to play. I mean at a super high level to get them because the other part of it is going to be who's going to exploit the small guy. Mm-hmm. You know, who's going to be able to exploit – can 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 Golden State exploit Isaiah? Can Cleveland exploit Steph? Because that's who they attack all the time when they get down to the – when it's just you can't yeah. score anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's who they go at, you know. And then it's going to be the big. Who's the big that they can attack? Can they attack David West and Zaza? And can those guys even hang in that series long enough? Mm. You know, can they continue to play in that series? Can – can you know the bigs for for Cleveland? Can Kevin Love and those guys play at a high level defensively in that series to stay on the floor? Yeah. So it's gonna be you know I think Cleveland has the best chance to beat them, but man, are they good? Go stay good just because they just shoot the ball so well. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 unbelievable. And and as you know, I mean, a lot of teams like Houston in particular, their philosophy is three pointer or in the paint for the most part. Mm-hmm. Do you worry about where the game is going? Like, I, I was watching the Houston-Golden State game the other night, and I know um, Durant – I don't think Durant or Harden played. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, they shot 80-something threes between the two teams. Right, right. And I, I feel like, personally, there's a threshold where if the game becomes – if it's too many three-pointers, I don't know what that number is, 90, 100, right. I don't know – but that it could really mess up the game. Is that just – am I an old-school guy who needs to wake up, or do you think there is any validity to – you know, we, we can't get it all three-pointers and layups. Well, here's – Spo used to have a great saying. I think Spo and Ron Ross used to say this in Miami, but they say, you know, you want threes, 
and layups. But to win it, you got to make tough twos. So you got to have guys that can shoot mid-range pull-ups, guys that can come off catch and shoots and make mid-range, mm-hmm. uh, guys that have floaters. You know, how many floaters had to be made last year's finals? Yeah. You know, to yep. keep that. So, I mean, you have to have guys that can make the skill shots in between to, to be the best of the best. Uh, so that's going to be interesting just to see how the number plays out. But the game dictates that to you. You know, you see it as a as a player, as a coach, as you're going through the flow of a game. If it's getting out of hand one way or another, when you're on the good side or the bad side on how to adjust your game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even even uh, Houston will will recognize if something's not working and emphasize one of the others more. So if it's not the the three ball, they're going to attack you. Okay. And you'll see them. You'll see them put an emphasis on attacking that paint. They'll do more catching and going. You know, guys out out on the perimeter as that ball comes off the pick and roll. These guys are putting it on the floor if they feel like they, you know, they're not really yeah. in a group from the three. So you'll see teams adjusted, but ultimately, yes, old timer, catch up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got the word from you. <laughs> it's happening, man. It's, I mean, I really thought I, I put such an emphasis on playing with pace this year and, and, and hey, we got to get the ball at the court, advance the ball, boom, boom, boom. Man, about 10, 15 games into it, I look at our stat, our ranking. We're still 28th. Yeah. It's the fastest the Grizzlies had ever played. And I'm like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> How fast is everybody else playing? Like, you know what I mean? And well, so, I saw something early in the year that said, remember the Steve Nash sons and yeah. how they were so fast compared to everybody else. I saw something <laughs> early in the year. They would have ranked 26th yeah. in today's NBA in pace. Yeah, we thought it was fast then. Yeah. And now it's everybody, oh, you know, man. and now it's everybody. And, and the way teams are constructing their rosters, are, are they're building them to be fast. And so, you know, you're just seeing uh, what it's doing is forcing the five men to evolve, right? You're seeing a huge evolution in, in the big man now where he's got to yeah. do so much – you know, he's got to be able to step out and shoot because the way that the point guard and the wings can attack, he's got to be able to switch. <laughs> he's got to be able to trap. You guys you, know? you guys had the two bigs in Gasol and Mark Gasol and Zach Randolph. Yeah. And you, obvi- you had some, I mean, what we would call, relatively speaking, great success against Golden State. You beat them three out of five games. You, I believe, yeah. yeah. And... um. Can a team – well, first let me ask you, what what would be – I mean, you've had probably as much success against Golden State as anybody. What would be the way to beat them, the best way to, to try to beat them, I guess? <laughs> you you got the answer, the man. You, <laughs> Play them early in the year. That's, what I, <laughs> that's my answer to beat them. But they uh, – you know, for whatever reason, I don't know – Sometimes it's matchups with teams, you know, where you you match up well with a team. Um, you know, I felt like you know we had a, a at least a solid game plan defensively that didn't leave a lot of gray area there for guys to be confused because Golden State can make you look stupid, mm-hmm. and, and and if you got a bunch of different things you're trying to do against them defensively, they're going to tear you apart. So we really simplified our game plan defensively. You try to be as physical as you can with them, but yeah. they not. These guys aren't soft. They've gone through the finals this many years in a row. They're like, ah, physical, so yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Back door layup. Right? So it's like, so you know, so you try that, but you really, it's more about your discipline. It's about really trying to limit the amount of times that they shoot clean threes. Um, you know, but ultimately, you 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 need them to miss some shots that night, really, and. Um, you know, we were just lucky enough in a lot of those games where we caught them on some tough nights, and and our guys obviously played well. And I do think when we had the Zebo Mark combination out there, especially late game, uh, and the game really slowed down, that played to our favor. But I don't know how much you can get away with doing that over the course of a series. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you because I look at like say even in New Orleans where you got Cousins and Anthony right. Davis. I always feel like, man, slow it down and play to that size. Can a team survive doing that in today's NBA? Well, I, I don't know if you could slow it down. I don't that I don't think you have a choice. 
Because at the end of the day, if you're slowing it down to take twos and they're going down making threes in 10 seconds, the math is going to work in their favor. And so your margin for error continues to shrink mathematically. Um, But the playoffs play at arts. They still are a different game. Um, But go to state, they will – I watch them. They they force pace on you. Mm. And I think New Orleans, as funny as it sounds, I think speed-wise New Orleans can keep up with them from the standpoint of Boogie and, and AD can really run. Yeah. And I don't think it necessarily, and Alvin does a good job of this, they don't necessarily have to play slower to beat them up. It's just how fast can you get the ball into the post to one of those guys and let them go to work. And so, um, but I just think that you, one thing you're not going to do is beat them at doing what they do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that I'm, I'm pretty sure that we, you know, that wasn't going to work in our favor. So, <laughs> um, you know, you got to try to get to the free throw line against them. Uh, so they're taking the ball out of the, you know, off the free throw. Yeah. Um, this is a lot of stuff you got to be good at and, and do well that night to beat them in just one game. So when you think about a series, um, you know, cause even for Cleveland, when they beat them, um, they had to play great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know, and, and they needed a, they needed Draymond to to have a, a make a bad decision. Yeah, you're right. Because that thing was on its way. Yeah, and you know, so like you you got to really everything's got to work in your favor against them. Because oh, by the way, they got a hell of a coaching staff. <laughs> so, <laughs> True. You know, Ron Adams, Mike Brown, yeah. Steve Kerr, that whole crew. Kyle is like pretty damn good coaching staff as well, <laughs> uh, along with those other assistants. So. You know, that's just not an easy out, man. And like I said, I was telling somebody the other day, they really have the, the – they're already on their way of doing it, but that's a legacy team for sure. Like, yeah. how can they not be? Like, you look back through our history, that's, you know, that's one of those teams. And, you know, they're about to hit their four finals here if they make it back this year. And it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out from a fatigue standpoint. Right? How good so, do you think Lonzo is or can be? He's a three-pointer away from being a heck of a guard in this league. He's a good player right now. I mean, he he pace, passing, length. Uh, he plays physical. He rebounds the ball. Like mm-hmm. he, I, I like him. I said it when we played him. I'm like, man, that's this kid can play. But again, you know, the further you go through this deal, the the worse that shot. You're just gonna end up becoming obsolete if you can't make threes. Yeah. Or at least keep people honest from there. Um, and not obsolete where you just can't play, but yeah. it, the further you go, your minutes are going to suffer. So I think he's just a summer or two away from developing a good enough shot. And who knows, you know, where he can go with it. Because uh, from everything I hear, the kid can work. How how so, soon do you want to – you want to be a head coach again, I'm sure. How soon you want? would you like to get back in into it? <laughs> Well, I, I love to get in ASAP. I think I'm too young to be on a hiatus. <laughs> be doing a sabbatical. <laughs> I don't think I had enough minutes long to be on a sabbatical. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I don't like wishing on other people's jobs. Yeah, I just I think that's bad karma. And I, I actually like every one of these guys. I have n- like nothing but great things to say about all 30 of the head coaches in this league. So. You know, for me to sit over here and wish for one of them to go down so I can have a seat, that's crap. And yeah. I wouldn't – that's just not who I am. And they know that. So, you know, but things happen in this league and, guys, it's happened to me. It's going to happen to other guys. And, yeah. you know, if the opportunity pops up sooner than later, I'm on it. And, you know, we'll, uh, i love to get back to the sidelines. But until then, I'm going to just take every minute, you know, to learn and also, you know, enjoy my family. What'd you learn from the situation in Memphis? Oh God, I got a, I can get <laughs> a you book a, full, a right? Tablet it out, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm still writing out notes, you know, as we speak of just of different things that um, that I would do differently. But uh, you know, I, the big one I think that I took is I came in there really well. Let me let me say it this way: I, I saw a window with that group of who, how long can they play at a high level? Tony, Mark, Mike, mm-hmm. and Zebo, and Vince Carter, to, to, yeah. to be honest with you. And how long can this group play at a high level? And, and because they're different, 
can I tweak them just enough to give us a chance to win it? Because that's the only way I know how to think. Mm-hmm. Is I wanted to win it. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't playing around when I said I was coming here to win a title. Like you've been around <laughs> me enough times, and yeah. you've seen how you be you've been been around my folks. So that's the only way I think. Yeah. And so I went in there with that mentality. And I think the thing that I really regret out of all of it is I went in there trying to force feed the leadership force feed this is who I want you to be force feed my where I see gaps in the culture that Mm -hmm. I think we should fill these gaps with this and I didn't let that develop organically and you know I do think some of it you got to push on them um, but I think it's much more just putting them in a position to absorb it um, but I was just think I was, I felt like I was, I, and I used to feel, I felt this pressure of like, I'm rushed because I don't know how long this group is going to stay together yeah. um, at this point, because it was, no matter, you know, whether you know, people are going to say things like, oh, he got rid of z and TA and all that. Come on, man. It ain't even about any of that. It ain't about me getting rid of anybody. This team, regardless of who the coach was going to be, is going to be in a transition. Yeah. This is where they are. This is the NBA. Take me out of the seat, put anybody in that seat. The Grizzlies was going to have to make some tough decisions in the next year or two anyway. Um, so, you know, it was just unfortunately how it ended. Uh, it looked like it was all messy, but really the relationships with T.A. and Zebo, those guys texted me right away when, I, when the whole thing went down. Well, that was the interesting Um, thing. Yeah, like, I mean, you – It was great. Yeah, you're known as a guy that players really like. I mean, in addition to them, I mean, Damian Lillard, who you never even coached, at least not for a season. He came out and supported you, LeBron, Wade. And then there were reports about Mark Gasol and your your problems with him. Mm -hmm. How – what was the situation there? And, I mean, that's odd for a guy, like you said, that, that so many players like to have, you know, the reports that there wasn't a good relationship with this star player? I just think that that's – every you're not going to be liked by everybody. And ultimately, I don't even care about that, Chris. Like, I want to be liked. That's great. I know everybody wants to be liked. But ultimately, again, I'm about winning. And we can, make, we can work through anything if all we're doing is working towards winning. And so, you know, I, I, I went into it expecting that, you know – somebody wasn't going to like me at some point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. it's happening. And, you know, it's just for what I, you know, it's, this isn't for us to be liked. I'm not coaching basketball. This is my, I'm not getting paid the money that I get paid to be liked. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Nick Saban isn't, isn't getting paid to be liked at Alabama. <laughs> and I don't think he's very liked by a lot of people. Yeah. But he's respected and he's a winner. And, you know, his guys that have gone through that gauntlet with him and won, they love him. <laughs> yeah. But he pushes buttons and he challenges people and he goes to a level uh, that's going to make people uncomfortable. And, and you know, I, that's how I'm built. And, uh, you know, Spoh's greatest line, I thought, was embrace discomfort. Mm. And I, so I try to create it as much as possible without, you know, I don't want to over, overdo it and piss people off, but I'm also going to push you to the place that I know can get us to the title. Mm. And that's what that's what my whole goal was, was how can I push all of these guys, you know, beyond what they've done? Because what they've done wasn't going to be good enough being a year older. Yeah. That's just not, not where the league is going. So how could I get them there? And I had to get on, that's going to get uncomfortable. And, you know, ultimately when you're losing, that stuff gets amplified. Mm. And that's what happened. Last question. You have one of the most memorable uh lines, excerpts, whatever we want to call it, in uh, uh, NBA playoff history. You know, take that for data. My you know? blackout moment. <laughs> when, <laughs> when you see that, what do you think? Were you just, you know, nah. just what was going on? <laughs> well, when I first saw it, I was like, I didn't realize I talked for that long and that I actually was like going on for that long a time. Like, just nonstop without a question. And then now I look at it and it's just funny to me that I was that ridiculous. <laughs> All right, yeah. Fizz. Well, look, man, thanks a lot for the time. Um, as you are, I'm looking forward to seeing you back on the sidelines. And uh, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thanks, Chris, man. I appreciate you too, man. Happy New Year. Yep, you too. All right, brother. All right, bro.
All right, yeah. Fizz. Well, look, man, thanks a lot for the time. Um, as you are, I'm looking forward to seeing you back on the sidelines. And uh, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thanks, Chris, man. I appreciate you too, man. Happy New Year. Yep, you too. All right, brother. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining the entire podcast. You heard from David Fisdale. Very good young coach. Wouldn't you agree? Very good. Uh, Shockwaves around the NBA when he was fired in Memphis. But gave us some great stories about LeBron James and the Miami Heat when he was there as an assistant there at Spolstra. And, you know, a lot of good stuff from, uh, from Fizdale. And, of course, my top five MVP candidates. And then knock down Jay. So check us out. Uh, go to iTunes. Go to Apple Podcasts. Go to uh, SoundCloud. Leave us a comment. Leave us five stars. Instagram. You got to step up your Instagram. Instagram. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever you can find us, go there and check us out on In The Zone. And we'll catch you next week.